Welcome, Pewter Report readers, viewers, and listeners to a brand new edition of the Pewter Report podcast, energized by Celsius, the official energy drink of PewterReport.com and the Pewter Report podcast. It is a Monday edition of the show. Hope everybody had a fantastic weekend, whether you're watching sports, maybe some WrestleMania, or even before this, maybe you enjoyed looking at the solar eclipse or lunar eclipse, whatever it is. But we're ready to get back into a great week of the Bucks football and the Pewter Report podcast as we begin Monday's show talking about the Bucks players that are going into their second year and who needs to have a big second season in order for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to make some damage uh, this upcoming season and try to win the division again for a fourth time in a row. I'm your host, Matt Matera. Joined with me is the face that runs the place of PewterReport.com, SR Scott Reynolds. Scott, ready for another week of box football? Yes, and um, we survived the eclipse, so there we go. We did. I got my yeah. glasses and everything, so I'm did good you? to go. Yeah, I just uh, looked up at the sun, and no, I'm just kidding. I didn't know that. No, <laughs> but I did listen to some Bonnie Tyler today, Till the Eclipse of the Heart, so I thought it was very appropriate to do that. Turn around. Okay, uh, let's get on with some Buccaneer talk. You don't want to hear me sing, that's for sure. Um, yeah, some um, you know s- some some news this week, a uh, little bit so far. Just as the draft inches closer, actually, a couple of, of uh, uh, things we should point out. We are having our annual uh, Bucks draft show. So it's our Peter Report draft show where we're going to be live from one Buccaneer place, uh, breaking down all of the, the picks, not just by the Buccaneers, but by the entire league. And um, in focusing mainly on your Tampa Bay Buccaneers, as well as the NFC South teams, uh, like only Peter Report can. We'll have the entire Peter Report staff um, present, and we'll be rotating uh, in there, giving our opinions and analysis and, and live on the air. So uh, just like these uh, uh, fantastic uh, uh, Peter Report shows that we do, um, you know, Peter Game Day, for example, right, where you listen uh, to Matt Matera uh, with, with his Bucks insight while you're watching the game. Same thing. Watch the draft and tune in to Peter Report because we're going to make it as buck centric as we can. And uh, we'll have all of the happenings live as they happen. And we'll go out and talk to Jason Light and Todd Bowles and come right back with some fresh intel as well. So it'd be fun time starting Thursday, the first day of the draft and going all the way through Friday and Saturday as well. So that's, that's an announcement. The Buccaneers also have uh, continued to bring in players for their top 30 visits. And it's interesting, Matt, we'll start here and then we'll go into the, um, um, Box today's topic players. yeah yeah um and of course we'll have roll call at 4 20 matt you're going to go on a rant today i think I am. and um so it's interesting because now the buccaneers have brought in uh, jonathan uh brooks uh, a running back from texas probably the top running back in um in this draft in terms of consensus now there is some question marks about him because he is coming off of an acl injury and he's meeting with the bucks and then i believe he's going to carolina or maybe that's vice versa, but then he's got to go back to the combine for a, uh, you know, it, it, to get that, that medical checked out again. So I think we're up to 13 names now when it comes to the players that the Buccaneers have brought in for top 13 visits. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> their list is growing more and more and running back obviously is, is a big position of need that at least we think for the Buccaneers this year, I think a lot is kind of hindering on, the performance of the backups, because, you know, Rashad White is the top guy. He's going to do his thing. He was just on the Bucks crew, so he's living life right now, yeah. really enjoying it. Um, but I, I think there's questions after running back. Sean Tucker, who is a second-year player, does need a big year. We won't necessarily yeah. start with him. Um, but it doesn't sound like there's a ton of great confidence in Sean Tucker and what he can do as a uh, backup running back. And right. obviously with Chase Edmonds back, there are concerns about his overall health just in his career he seems to get hurt all yeah. the time so it, it does lead towards a path where the bucks do go with the running back and hopefully jason light as great as he's been drafting running backs hopefully he can kind of break a streak that he's yeah. had with kind of drafting subpar guys with the exception yeah. of rashad white he's really been the only one that's yeah that's kind of stood out so yeah um, I, I, honestly i think jason light's been terrible at drafting running backs right you start with charles uh, sims back yeah. in 2014 in the third round then you got Jeremy McNichols out of 
uh, Boise State. I think that was a Dirk Cutter um, selection, right? Dirk is from Idaho, and and um, and you know, and then you have Ronald Jones as well, and another uh, draft pick miss. I think Rojo had 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 one good year, yeah, which was the Super Bowl season. But then after that, just you know, just couldn't do it, and then Leonard Fournette beat him out. Then you you look at Keyshawn Vaughn, and, and you're right, Matt. I think Rashad White's been the only running back that Jay Slide has drafted very well. And, and so when you look at the offensive players that that the Bucks have brought in yet for the top 30 visits, um, Texas running back Jonathan Brooks, a couple of Florida State or should say a couple of wide receivers, Florida State's Keon Coleman, Western Kentucky's Malachi Corley, who's pictured there, Kansas State tight end Ben Sennett, and Illinois tight end tip Ryman. The interesting thing, Matt, is no offensive linemen have been brought in yet, or at least that we know of, right? I think we're 13 names out of the 30 that we've been able to identify or, or it's been reported out there and, and no offensive linemen yet. And, and yet at the combine, they had 10 formal interviews with offensive linemen. Yeah. I wonder if this is a swerve coming from Jason Light. If everyone infamously remembers last year when Kalijah Kansi was drafted by the Buccaneers with the first overall pick, well, the Bucs first overall pick, the 19th overall pick in that first round there at the time, wasn't too much of a connection between Kalijah Kansi and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They didn't meet formally with him That's right. at the, um, at the combine. I don't believe he was on a top 30 visit, visit either. Yeah. So it was just completely, out of left field. So, you know, I, I don't think all the other NFL teams are going up. Oh, well, the Bucs did this last year. They might be doing it again. That's obviously something us as reporters and media and, and fans will probably pay a little bit more attention to than yeah. what the Colts are, are thinking, what the Bucs are doing, or what the Steelers think the Bucs are doing. So right. um, does it necessarily mean that the Bucs aren't looking at offensive line? I don't think so. Again, Jackson Powers Johnson, who we talked about a ton on this show. Yeah. Uh, if he's there uh, with the first overall pick for the Bucks this year, um, I don't think, oh, well, we didn't bring him in. <laughs> I don't think that necessarily means yeah. that they're not going to take him. It is something to take note of for sure, but it's just – it's not the end-all, be-all, which right. I guess overall is a good thing. Yeah, and I, th I think we we are able to identify 23 out of the 30 players that they brought in for visits. Now, the teams are doing more Zoom calls, right? For example, last year, out of the 23 names that we identified – that were top 30 visits for the Buccaneers. None of them were drafted by the Buccaneers. Yeah. And, and, and only Trey Palmer, who said he had a Zoom call with the Buccaneers, was, was one of those players that was selected. Now, they did draft a handful of players, literally five, from the Senior Bowl, so that was a good indicator. But, but then the previous year, in 2022, they had in multiple players that they ended up drafting in for top 30 visits, including Logan Hall including Kate Otten and also including Rashad White. Those three players were drafted by the Bucks, and and that was rounds two, three, and four. So there were th those were the, the more prominent picks that year, and they did come in for top 30 visits. So uh, Jason Light's either going to show his hand or it's going to be a smoke screen, and, and if people don't come in for visits, maybe he picks them. We'll have to see. On the defensive side, it's interesting to note, Matt, because we think this is going to be more of an offensive draft with needs at offensive line, especially in the interior and at wide receiver and also running back. But the Buccaneers have actually brought in, at least so far, more defensive players in for top 30 visits. Uh, Western Michigan outside linebacker Marshawn Neeland, who was really a defensive end at Western Michigan, yeah. but if he's drafted by the Bucs, he'll be an edge rusher and outside linebacker. Texas defensive tackle Byron Murphy, Texas A&M inside linebacker, who you see there, Edgerin Cooper, Kentucky inside linebacker Trevin Wallace, who we both saw at the Senior Bowl, Clemson inside linebacker Jeremiah Trotter Jr., who, yes, is the son of former Eagles stud inside linebacker Jeremiah Trotter. Alabama cornerback Kool-Aid McKinstry. Michigan nickelback Mike Sandristill. And Air Force safety Trey Taylor, who's probably going to be a seventh-round pick or a undrafted free agent, what they call a priority free agent. Um, and and that, that's what teams will do. They, they will use the top 30 visits, not just for the top guys that they might be interested in or yeah. guys in the premium picks, but they'll also usually have five or six of those picks uh, or visits that they're allowed to have be on guys that may or may not get drafted. We saw Chris Murray come yes, in for a top 30 visit last year from Oklahoma, the center. 
he didn't get drafted. He was a priority free agent by the Buccaneers. And and they use these visits to kind of do some recruiting, to get yeah. to know the player and say, hey, if you go undrafted, you know, we might take you in the sixth or seventh round, but if you go undrafted, we want you here in Tampa. Here's our depth chart. Here's our playbook. Like, we think you're a really good fit scheme-wise. So it's a little bit of salesmanship there because, as we know, Matt, after the draft is over, boom, it's free agency all over again. Yep. And uh, and it's fast and furious with the phone calls trying to get these guys signed um, uh, before other teams can, can grab them up. Absolutely. And maybe someone like Trey Taylor, this isn't the example. But also, shout out, there was – a pewter person a couple of weeks ago that was like, have you guys looked at Trey Taylor? Yeah. Uh, he's the cousin or that he's the nephew of Ed Reed. So shout out to that, that commenter. Uh, Cause yeah. that sparked my, my memory again. Uh, but other times they will bring in players that maybe they don't even have intentions of drafting, but it helps them yep. get a little more insight about other teammates of theirs that they play with. I think Mike Edwards, who's now with the Buffalo mm -hmm. bills was a big time example. When he came out of Kentucky, the bucks were talking to, you know, Josh Allen, who obviously was right. going to be like a, a, a top five pick. Um, Lonnie Johnson, I believe, was a defensive back from Kentucky as yep. well that played with Mike Edwards. And they were kind of sold on Mike Edwards based on talking to his teammates um, over yep. at Kentucky. So you might see that a little bit between everything that went on in the draft and the top 30 visit um, as well. So keep that in mind with some of these yeah. visits, too. That's one question that the Buccaneers and other NFL teams use which is, hey, if you could bring one of your teammates from college yes. with you here, who would it be? And when you have all the Kentucky players saying mm -hmm. Mike Edwards, like that's a pretty good indicator of how those players feel about their teammate. And so, um, you know, it could be a thing where uh, Keon Coleman comes in the building and they're asking about Trey Benson, right? The yeah, running back, for example, exactly. or Jared Verse, right? So it, it's that type of scenario. We got a super chat from KL Edwards. Great start Thanks, to the week. KL, Thank for the $10 super chat. Remember, if you super chat us, really doesn't matter what the topic is. We are happy to get into it because if you super chat us, you cut the line. So KL says, Matt and SR, I really think this offense is poised to break out with Godwin back in the slot. Improvement of the running game via interior offensive line upgrade in the draft and an experienced play caller. Thoughts? Really don't disagree with anything that yeah. you said, KL. I think, again, some of the growing pains as far as play calling wise that the Bucks experienced last year with Dave Canales, who was a first time play caller, they won't have that because Liam Cohen has been around the block with the Rams, and then obviously getting a lot more play calling experience with Kentucky as their offensive yeah. coordinator. So I think that's greatly important. Chris Godwin moving back to the slot and trying to recapture kind of what he was when Bruce Arians first got here and installed the Bruce Arians style of offense, um, that I think could really be the, the catalyst or the entrance engine that really drives this Buccaneers offense. Cause if they get any type of semblance of Chris Goblin from 2019 and 2020, yeah. I mean, look out, we are looking at another just like fantastic passing game situation with Mike Evans and then Chris Godwin truly doing damage. And then we'll see how the Bucs address wide receiver three, whether in the draft or they think Trey Palmer can be the next guy. So I think Chris Godwin, I think, can really be the kind of the straw that stirs the drink to the offense this year. And I, I agree with what you said about the running game, too. A lot of this will be hopefully patched up with Liam Cohen again as the new offensive coordinator. If they get a stud center in the first round, that goes a long way as well. So, yeah, I truly think there's a lot of great things to build on from what Tampa Bay did last year as an offense. And now you got all these guys in year two with Baker working with Mike. And um, I think there's great reason to have a ton of optimism about this group. Yeah, I do too. I, I think the well said, I really don't have anything else to add. You nailed yeah, it. That's um, right. <laughs> and you know what? I think too, it's going to be really exciting, the different wrinkles and, and the different scheme. It's going to have a lot of similarity to what Dave Canales ran last year that was successful, more successful than it was with Byron Leftwich in the last you know, gasp of the Bruce Arians offense. But but uh, I, I think more importantly, you're going to see more three wide receiver sets and you're going to see uh, more three by one splits or one by three splits. Uh, and and it's, it's going to be, I, I think the running game is going to be better because the Buccaneers are, are going to be getting away from double tight end sets. You know, I've yes. always, I've always been, uh, a big proponent of running double tight end sets when you have two good tight ends that can run block, right? When when you had Rob Gronkowski here in Tampa, he was a very good run yeah. blocker. 
you know, you can get away with a lot of that. But, you know, Kate Otten and Payne Durham or Kate Otten and David Wells for a minute or Kate Otten and um, uh, who, uh, Co Keefe, you yeah. know, I, they're, they're not that good at run blocking. And so I, I just think that you're you're asking for trouble uh, going up against some of those those tougher goal line fronts. Uh, on short yardage situations or or more of like a base defense. Now when you go with three wide receivers, Matt, you're running a, up against more nickel and dime packages, yeah. lighter boxes. And I think for a player like Rashad White, who when he can get to the second level, has some elusiveness, has some tackle breaking ability, is just getting through the line of scrimmage that's been the problem, right? So if you have that lighter box and you give him a little bit of a crease, he's got two linebackers to deal with rather than three, or maybe a team is playing it in dime. And, and I think that it's going to open things up. And, of course, having Godwin back in the slot to come back yeah. to this point is a very good run blocker at the point of attack in, the, in the, the slot. And that's what Greg Cassell, who was on the show with us on Thursday, had talked about with part of having Liam Cohen as the new offensive coordinator is yes. that these wide receivers got to be ready to block. And Chris Godwin has been a guy that has welcomed the physicality nature of a blocking wide receiver. And what's been the message since Liam Cohen has gotten here, at least when we've been able to speak to him players over plays yep. players over plays so to exactly what you were just saying scott if they have a tight end room that isn't great at run blocking don't why would you do put, it why exactly <laughs> right. don't ask them to do it why yeah. would you put two tight ends on the field when neither of them are really going to yeah. totally flourish in this role when you can have mike evans chris godwin and then who mm -hmm. knows keon coleman malachi corley Trey Palmer, someone else that becomes available. Yep. Play to your strengths. Your strengths are Mike Evans and Chris, and hopefully Chris Godwin in the slot, but at least for damn sure, Mike Evans. So just play to those strengths and don't worry about getting cute in different ways. Efficiency yeah, exactly. is the name of the game. No one will care if the Bucs score 35 points a game, whether they're doing it, passing it 100 <laughs> times or running it 100 times. So they'll go, wow, 35 points. That's awesome. The Bucs should be yep. undefeated in that case. We always played our strengths here at Pewter Reports on the Pewter Report podcast, especially Mondays at 420, because our strength is you, oh, yeah. Pewter people. It's you. That's right. It is time for Roll Call. We do this every single Monday show or the first show of the week. It's a great way that we um, interact with all of our fans, the Pewter people, as we like to call you. Um, we couldn't do this show without you guys, and we're very grateful and uh, we try to interact with you guys as much as we possibly can. So this is one way that we do it on Monday shows at 420. Uh, one of us goes on a little rant or a diatribe or just kind of saying how we're feeling uh, about the Buccaneers. Today, I'm going to do that. And uh, while I'm talking about the Buccaneers, uh, Scott's going to put on in the chat uh, where you guys are watching from uh, on the screen. So we're already getting a bunch of people in. So, Scott, feel free to take it away with the uh, Peter people in the chats. And I'll get it going. So – the big news with the Buccaneers last week, and I'm kind of kind of pool a couple of things together at, with the outside linebacker position. So the, the big deal, obviously, last week was Randy Gregory signing to the Buccaneers on a one-year deal. It's about $3 million or so, so not the most gigantic contract of all time. It still allows the Bucs to um, handle different situations, sign other players, and they're certainly not – breaking the bank and the Randy Gregory thing comes up at a very interesting time because there was a story a couple of days before that it came out from Bleacher Report and um, I gave my opinion on it as well we put it on pewterreport.com about a hypothetical trade um, involving outside linebacker Joe Tryon Shoyinka who is in the last year of his deal because JTS his fifth year option because he was a first round pick by the Bucks. His fifth-year option was not picked up by Tampa Bay. So this is the last year of his deal. He is in a contract season. And pretty much this uh, this trade idea that was brought up, and we mentioned it on the show, but we can kind of expand upon it now. The idea was trading Joe Tryon Shayanka to the Dallas Cowboys and getting a fifth-round pick in return for said trade. That's right. Now, with Randy Gregory, with the signing – I still don't think it's very likely that JTS gets traded, but what it does is it gives the Bucs a little bit more room where if they wanted to trade an outside linebacker, JTS in this situation. Or maybe even Anthony Nelson. Or yeah, Anthony Nelson. His deal. It does give them a little bit more room because they could still draft an outside linebacker in this year's draft. But even if they stay afoot right now, 
You got Yaya Diaby, JTS, Anthony Nelson, Randy Gregory. I'm just in no particular order. And then Marquise Watts and Jose Ramirez. So even if you draft another one, you got a good player. And unfortunately, it's probably going to be Marquise Watts and Jose Ramirez that doesn't make the team and is going to have to end up on the practice squad. Now, the JTS idea of trading him, I think, is an interesting one because let's remember the Bucs do recoup a fifth round pick that uh, they were losing a pick this year because they yeah. used it to trade up last year to go get Trey Palmer. So they are recouping a pick that they didn't have last year. It also cuts down the long wait that they would have had from the fourth round to the sixth round. So they kind of cut that in half, recoup a pick from the fifth round, and it allows them to kind of move up at once again if they want to, if they want to dive back into um, the fourth round. It obviously, if you trade JTS, it does give an opportunity for Marquise Watts to get a little more playing time, which is something we've discussed. It allows mm-hmm. Jose R- Ramirez to play at all, which he didn't get to yeah. last season. And Bucks save a little bit of money. I think it's around $2.2 million or something like that, which they would save by trading Joe Tryon Chayenka. But if there's not an exact spot for him on this team, I know they're going to um, experiment with him playing the Joker position. Sure, I would like to see that, and I think we will because I don't think he's going to get yeah. traded. But he already hasn't worked out an outside linebacker. Odds are he's probably gone after this season unless yeah. he really, really produces. And even if he has a great year, then every other team can sign him as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just an interesting food for thought. I'm curious what the uh, what the Peter people think, uh, if they would do this trade, if they wouldn't. I think they should still hold on to Joe Tryon Shanka. But with Randy Gregory, the other thing we also have to think about is that Last year was the first season that he fully played all 17 games or previously 16 games in the season. Now, some of it was injury. Some of it was suspensions, um, failing right. drug tests and things like yeah. that. So part of it is on himself. I get it. Like, it's just weed. But also, like, as Stephen A. Yeah, Smith once said, doing it, you're... stay off the weed, right. um, <laughs> as Stephen A. Smith once said. So, yeah. like, I don't know. I, I just... I think he's 30 or 31 now. I, 31, I'm not yeah. banking on him being healthy every single year. And if something happens to Randy Gregory, and I should just say one year, he's on a one-year deal. Yeah. What happens if he goes down? Are you trusting Marquise Watts? Are you trusting Jose Ramirez? Yeah. You still have JTS in the mix. You at least you know you have a guy that started started a lot towards the end of the year a couple of seasons ago when Shaq Barrett was out, and it was right. literally just him and Anthony Nelson. So interesting also, to think you know, about. And yeah. I, I'm with you, and, and I think, you know, JTS, I think he played better when he was removed from the starting lineup too, right? Yeah. With, he actually had more impact with lesser snaps because he made him count as yeah. opposed to, you know, being just the, the guy out of the tunnel and, you know, and, and starting all the time. So, um, but uh, listen, we, we had some great participation during uh, roll call uh, today. Uh, a lot of international folks today, which nice. was really kind of cool to see. So let's spend just a minute or two here. Uh, recapping some of the, uh, the 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 peeps, the pewter people, and their locations. Kieran Butt, we always appreciate you tuning in from Norwich, UK. Uh, we've got uh, Dante Campagna from uh, very cool from Brazil, which was very cool. Um, so we're we're in different hemispheres here yes. today. Uh, we've got uh, some Midwestern love, uh, Black Crow Volume Two from Iowa, as well as Tom Foolery from Casper, Wyoming. We've got uh, a northerner, uh, Darius Miller, watching from Rochester, New York, birthplace nice. of the Glacier family in a direct line of the solar eclipse. So People in Rochester love their solar eclipse. I can yeah. I can confirm <laughs> that knowing some people from Rochester. They love yeah. this uh, solar eclipse. Christopher Oxentine, I didn't look directly at the sun during the solar eclipse in Overland Park, Kansas, my old stomping grounds. And we've got uh, Felix Schmidt from Edmonton, Canada. And Manchester, England, we've got Drew Sherratt watching. And a place I vacationed with my lovely wife, Ashley, earlier this year. Louisville, Kentucky. I almost said Louisville, but it's Louisville. Louisville, Kentucky, James Hamilton. And last but not least, Trevor in Orlando. Um, actually in Apopka, Florida. Not in Orlando. Just outside of Orlando. Yeah. In Apopka, <laughs> Florida. So uh, really cool stuff. We appreciate all the participation today. And uh, speaking of Trevor. Trevor Sykema is going to be our guest on Thursday show. We have a we had a big show last week. We had a great uh, guest with um, with Cosell. NFL Networks, uh, uh, Greg Cosell, and we've got um, we, we've got. Uh, let me put this up here so we can get there. We go. Bucks first round draft strategy. 
with a former Pewter reporter and current pro football focused analyst, Trevor Sikama. That's going to be next Thursday show. We were supposed to have Greg Allman last week on the show. A scheduling conflict prevented that from happening, but we have some good news. Greg's going to be on the show tomorrow talking about, do the Bucks still rule the NFC South? Fox Sports' is Greg Allman, friend of the program, coming back on to talk not just about the Buccaneers, a team he knows intimately well, but also the Falcons, Saints, and Panthers. And then on Wednesday show, don't have a graphic for it, but we will have our latest mock draft. This will be mock draft number four. Josh Capo and I are, co- are collaborating on this one again. And we'll be talking about our mock draft number four. And that will be on Wednesday show. So an action-packed week of Peter Report yes. podcasts coming your way. A big time week for sure. Almost as big as the new flavors of Celsius, the Celsius Essentials. These are the tall boys of energy drinks. They have 270 milligrams of caffeine. So a little extra oomph, a little extra punch to your uh, Celsius energy drinks uh, if you are having one. They got great flavors like the Blue Crush and the Dragonberry. Can't forget about the OG flavors as well. The Strawberry Lemonade and the Arctic Vibe are some of my favorite flavors of celsius if you need to know where to find a celsius energy drink you're like oh man there's not one near me don't you worry just go to the celsius store locator on their website punch in your address and i'll tell you the closest location where you can pick up a celsius energy drink could be a local walmart 7-eleven health and fitness store or if you're lucky enough it might just be your bodega bodega and once you keep going to your bodega and you know you love Celsius and you want to get more, you want to get it in bulk because you heard me talk about the amazing flavors of Celsius, you can get the variety pack and get it in bulk. Variety is the spice of life, so don't limit yourself to just one flavor of Celsius when there's a ton of great flavors. Um, go to the go to Amazon, click on the subscribe and save, and you can have it sent to your place of residence really whenever you want. Could be a week, month, quarterly, yearly. You're in charge. You're the captain. Just make sure you're drinking Celsius Energy Drinks, the official energy drink of the Pewter Report podcast. As Paul Bowen says, all the vibe flavors are great. I have strongly to agree. agree. Yeah. Strongly agree, Paul. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what type of, of sorcery that they do uh, in the Celsius labs uh, to conjure up such uh, fantastic tasting energy drinks. But, man, they nail the flavors. I mean, yeah. orange tastes like orange. Grape tastes like grape. Wild berry tastes like a bunch of wild berries in your mouth. It's really I feel really like good. I'm on an oasis when I'm yeah. drinking the oasis. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so let's um, let's dive into today's uh, program, uh, shall we? Let's see here. Trevor, a uh, part of the Scott Reynolds Sports Writer Tree. It just means I'm old. <laughs> That's all that <laughs> means. Uh, we do have a couple of of uh, of late additions here. We'll get you guys. Jeff yeah. Moore from Lake Lure, North Carolina. We have Jeremy uh, from Tampa, Florida. And I thought I saw another one here. Here we go. Yep. Drake uh, from Virginia. So appreciate that very much, Drake. And we also have Logan from Cape Coral, Florida. So appreciate you guys tuning in, especially on Mondays. It's always fun. Yes. We do roll call. Um, but let's dive into today's topic, shall we? Today's topic is these bucks need a big second year. And uh, it might seem kind of obvious, but we're going to kind of break down some of the intricacies about what exactly these players need to do yeah. to have that that big second year. Because the Buccaneers, you know, they they like to draft, and I think they've drafted well the last couple of years, Matt. And, the, and then as we see, they like to resign their own. They don't like to they dabble do. too much in free agency. And so let's start at the top with uh, with Kalijah Kansi, the Bucks' first round draft pick last year. I think the biggest thing, and it's so hard to do, right, uh, is, is to uh, avoid injury. Uh, yeah. It's it, because you can't fault players for getting injured unless they don't take care of their bodies. And I think with that calf injury, um, it, it was a little fluky more than anything else for Kalaja Kansi, but he did miss some valuable playing time. It kind of put him behind the eight ball a little bit. And and I think with with Kalaja, you when you look at at um, you know he made his debut essentially against the Lions yeah. after the bye week. And Very true. And, and had a sack in that game. And I think the biggest thing with Kalijah is, is just to get bigger and stronger, right? You, he's never going to be a guy that that is 300 pounds. It just doesn't have the frame for it. He's also not going to grow. He's probably done growing. He's yeah. barely six foot one, uh, maybe six foot and a half. Uh, but he's got to get bigger and stronger uh, just to hold up against some of those double teams, 
that he's going to face. And I think that from a physical standpoint, Matt, you look at at uh, players, they make their biggest jump in terms of re shaping their body right when they're professionals you don't have to do the the combine training yeah. you don't have to, to do the all-star games you don't have to do the top 30 circuit anymore Elijah can just like all these buccaneer players have been buccaneers this entire off season and get focused on your craft yeah i, I look at Elijah can and this won't come as the most shocking thing because it's be why he was their first round pick but i think out of the whole draft class or i should just say second year players because they're are a number of undrafted free agents that contributed to the box this year. But Kalaja Kansi, I think, has the most potential to really be um, a, a breakout star. I mean, I, I, I think we're kind of overlooking a little bit how difficult it is to miss an entire preseason, an entire training camp. Yeah. And then you have to – I mean, he played a little bit in the first game against Minnesota, had a quarterback right. hit against Kirk Cousins. So yeah. the Bucs will be hoping he has a lot of quarterback <laughs> hits against Kirk Cousins this year. Twice a year, yeah. But, yeah, really didn't play until that the creamsicle game uh, against the Detroit Lions and, you know, made an impact so quickly. And then, you know, he had four sacks on the year. And towards the end, his last sack of the regular season came on December 10th. Didn't yeah. have a sack for the rest of the regular season. So you start thinking like, oh, maybe he started to hit – that wall a little bit, but then nope, recorded a sack and a half in the playoffs, one against yeah. the Eagles, one against Detroit. So now going into this season, and we've seen before guys like in different positions, but like Zion McCollum, Scotty Miller, two guys that popped in my head where when they were rookies, they got injured during training camp and missed some yeah. time and not even as much time as, as Kalijah Kansi did. And I think it really derailed them um, in, in their rookie seasons where that was not the case for, Kalijah can't see. Um, I, I agree with you. I mean, obviously health is so important and specifically for him at defensive tackle, he's got speed. He's got burst. He's got a nice little swim move too. So if you yeah. can just add a little bit more, you're, you're never going to ask your defensive tackle to be like the team leader in sacks or anything like that. Right. But the Bucks have kind of done that, whether it's Vita Vea just dominating at nose tackle and now Kalijah can't see um, really getting in there. I think can't is going to, much like Vita Vea has in his career, really, really help out in ways that maybe you don't necessarily always see on the yeah. stat sheet. But I think he can clean it up, stop in the run a little bit. And mm -hmm. I'm excited. Just year two, bigger, stronger, faster. Kalisha can't see a full year under his belt. And again, getting to play next to Vita Vea, who's yeah. one of the best interior defensive linemen in the league. Um, super excited for, um, for Kalisha can this year. Yeah, and, and I think, too, when you look at, at uh, the picture there of, of Kalijah Kansi and, and Yaya Diaby, the thing that the Jason Light mentioned at the Combine, and it's something you and I have, have noticed, Matt, just in the locker room and, and talking to, you know, to, uh, to Kalijah and also Yaya, is those guys, their lockers are next to each other. They came in yes. together, part of the same draft class. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they... ACC. Yeah, they, they, they're... There are two peas in the pod, and and I'm I'm not saying that these two guys are going to be Hall of Famers like Derek Brooks and Warren Sapp, but the 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 trait that those guys have is coming in together, very serious about football. Yeah, and and for Brooks and Sapp, it was it was getting this team back to respectability, which really hadn't happened since like 1979, you know, before right. before they came in. But it was turning the Yuccaneers into the Buccaneers, something, you know, to be feared rather than an opponent to, to you know, put on the schedule as the homecoming opponent, right? And, yeah. and, 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 and they were able to do that together. And I think that when you look at this defense, uh, Vita Vea is 29. The future is with Kalaja Kansi and Yaya Diaby. And I think both of those guys um, have have the the seriousness about themselves and the camaraderie to maybe form that inside outside pass rush that we we saw with Vita Vea and Adama Kansu in the middle with Shaq yeah. Barrett and JPP on the outside or way back in the day Simeon Rice on the edge with with Warren Sapp in the middle. So I, I I think that that they're off to a really good start just from a mental standpoint of taking their craft seriously yes. and wanting to really be great. For sure. We've seen the Bucks when they have guys that play the same position that were kind of either brought in together or a year apart. I mean, I know they just traded Carlton Davis, but we all know how close that secondary was yep. with Carlton Davis and Jamel Dean and Jordan Whitehead, who was drafted there and now back and same with Antoine Winfield Jr. And 
the Bucks in the past have had dynamic duos, two guys that are formidable. You mentioned some of them with like Vita and, and Sue and yeah. Shaq and JPP. But it's it's really been a while, at least up front, where um, they had a lot of homegrown guys. Now, Vita Vey was a homegrown guy, but let's remember, Shaq Barrett was a free agent signing. So was right. Jason, Jason Pierre, Pierre, Pierre Paul. Yeah, so was Jason Pierre Paul. Dom Kitsu yeah. obviously um, signed as a free agent later on into his career. So right. they've kind of done it, you know, at linebacker. Obviously, Levante's homegrown and Devin White was, and everybody I just mentioned in the secondary, but there's something about drafting a player and seeing them kind of like build into what they can truly be that I think the fans appreciate a little bit more. Now it's not going to stop any team from signing a better free agent uh, for sentimental reasons. Right. Uh, but uh, I think there's a great opportunity with, with Kalaja Kansi and Yaya Diaby to, to do something that we really haven't seen in Tampa Bay in a little while. Yeah, exactly. Uh, good comment here from Grizz. Kalaja was always helping out Diaby with this technique. It was evident from those mic'd up segments they ran all of last year. Those guys that are doing the work need to improve for sure. And we're going to stay on, on yeah, yeah, Diaby. We haven't forgotten about Cody Malk. We'll get to him in yeah. a second here. <laughs> but uh, but the thing with, with Diaby that he really has to uh, to to hone in on is, yes, he, he got this, the sack, you know, uh, king, um, you know, declaration, right? He had seven and a half sacks, led the team yeah. this year. But at the same time, his pass rush win rate was not good. It was yeah. about 7%. And to put that in perspective, Joe Tron Shawinka was was better at just under eleven percent. Shaq Barrett was actually the, the leader in terms of the regular players at fifteen and a half percent. So you look at Shaq Barrett, only four and a half sacks, but really had a double the pass rush win rate percentage that Yaya Diaby had. Now he's got the physical tools. He's a good run stuffer. He can make the tackles for loss. He's just got to work on the agility, the flexibility. Yeah. He's a little bit stiff. He's a little bit linear. And that's one thing he told me this offseason he wants to work on is, is getting more loose in his hips so he can bend that arc a little bit better and, and rush the passer and win some more of those one-on-ones against tackles. And and uh, I've got no doubt in my, in my mind that he'll be better at that this year. But if he can do that, Matt, this guy really does have a chance as Todd Bull said, of possibly being a double-digit sacker in Tampa. Yeah, the good news for Yaya Diaby is that he makes a lot of the hustle plays, which is what you love to see, especially in a young player. Like, I remember when he got that sack against Josh Allen when the yeah. Bucks played against the Bills on Thursday Night Football in Buffalo. That was strictly a hustle play. Like, right. he chased down Josh Allen and prevented him from scrambling down the field. And, you know, that's how uh, he got on the board right there. Um on that on that Thursday night game. So Yaya has the hustle down. And I think I'll always take that over, you know, just a guy that's skilled and talented yeah. in the first place. But he needs to add more to his pass rushing game. Like Shaq Barrett used to always say, I have an arsenal of pass rushing moves. Yaya doesn't really have that right now. He's just relying on effort, bull rush, trying to be stronger than the guy that he's going up against. And that could take you to a certain level, but I don't think that could take you to your full potential. Right. Um, so I think for everything I said about Kalijah Kansi, how he's got a good swim move and things like that, Yaya needs to implement a swim move. Yaya yeah. needs to try a spin move. Yaya needs to try a couple of different things because he got seven and a half sacks. Let's remember he didn't start until like November, um, right. of that year and still got seven and a half sacks really on just hard and hustle. If he can start really building out like one or two moves, like it, it doesn't need to be five different moves that Yaya's doing. Like, even some of the best, like Dwight Freeney, you knew the spin move was coming. You still couldn't stop it. Right. Um, so I think that should really be Yaya's goal this year is to, obviously, if he has five moves, fantastic. That'd be amazing. Right. But find one or two pass rushing moves that he legitimately knows he can master and feel comfortable doing and implement that into his pass rushing game. And yeah. when he was on our show during the season last year, he said – I think he said he was doing Zumba or something like that to mm -hmm. work on his flexibility and cutting down those angles just by a, a half a second yeah. or so, I think could be really important too. Yeah. And you know, I think the push pull, that's another move he started to incorporate last year as well. And, and um, you know, it, it's also the chess game, right? It's, it's being yes. able to set, it's being able to set the tackle up right with the second down rush 
you know, just like the first down rush, a hard rush to the outside, little dip and rip action. But then on third down, you know, like you said, an inside spin or a go step back inside. It's getting that that chess game of of wanting to on the money down third down, get the tackle to do what you want him to do, not yeah. what the tackle wants to do. And so I think that's that that's the big thing there for him. Um, Cody Malk, the second round pick for the Buccaneers. This is a player that, that the Buccaneers are very high on. I know you look at the pro football focus grade and you're like, yeah, you know, not a good year. He did have some ups and downs. He gave up eight sacks, gave up a ton of, of pressures. But the one, I think, redeeming quality about him, and I, I think that most people would agree, he hung in there and was not the liability that yeah. Luke Gedeke was in his rookie season where he pretty much played his way out of the starting lineup as a left guard. And Cody Malk experienced the same kind of difficulty going from left tackle at North Dakota State to right guard in the NFL. I, I thought it would have made better sense to put him at left guard, to be perfectly frank with you, because yeah. it just keep the guy on the same side rather than having to, to learn the opposite hand and footwork. But I think second year, this guy is really going to, to blossom. The, what the coaches have said, and we even heard this too. We talked to Dave Canales. Uh, I don't think we're spilling any secrets here. I mean, Canales loves the guy. Um, but we talked to Dave Canales at the NFL owners meeting. He was still very high on Cody Malk. And he said, yeah, he's he's a player that just needed to play and just yeah. get that experience. And that he didn't make the same mistake twice in the same series or in the same game. You know, And, and I think the biggest thing for him is to come back this offseason looking more like a guard than a tackle. And you see that that picture there, if you're listening on the audio uh, version of, of our podcast, he, he looks like a tackle. He's slender. He's long. He's 6'5", right? You, you need some trunk. Uh, you need some a bigger butt, the bigger hips, the bigger thighs, et cetera, that core strength. I think that's going to help him anchor better in pass protection and have more oomph as a, as a drive blocker in the run game too. I got to say, out of this entire draft class and maybe some of the undrafted free agents uh, that, that we may talk about, Cody Malk is probably the player on this list that I'm honestly the least concerned about. Yeah. I mean, he held his own little ups and downs. That's going to go and come, especially with an interior offensive lineman. He always kept a great attitude about it. Um, again, the hustle's there. I keep going back to that screenplay to Rashad White where yeah. Cody Malk – not a wide receiver, not uh, – I guess Rashad White was the running back on the play, but yeah. not like a speed guy. It was Cody Mount, the first guy that was running stride for stride with uh, with Rashad White on that screen pass That's touchdown. Right. He's got the physical tools. He loves being physical. Not at a Ryan Jensen level yet, despite the uh, the, right. the long hair. But, you know, you got Luke Gedeke, who's a little bit chippy. And I've said the Luke Gedeke comparison before, too. But if Luke Gedeke – took a major step in year two and granted playing at a different position. If we saw it with guys like Alex Cap back in yeah. the day, I see no reason why Cody Malk can't be that type of player either. I the agree. run game needs to improve. He needs to get better, but I have all the confidence that he's going to get better. And then if they upgrade at center or at least at left guard, who knows what this run game could do? At least yeah. it won't be last in the league. Right. And new offensive line coach, too. I think that yes. might have, you know, some some benefit to Cody Malk's game as well. And uh, Kevin Carberry is w well regarded and certainly has that familiarity with Liam Cohen and, yeah. and and comes from the Rams system to implement that here in Tampa. So it's a really good fit from the fact that he actually has some some you know teaching ability within this scheme because he's been a part of it before. So I think that's going to help Cody Malk as well. Um, we got a, a super chat here. Yes, not the rule. If you super chat us, you stop the show. We answer your questions. Yeah. And we have one from uh, Jose Ortiz right here. Yeah, thank you, host Sway, for the 999 super chat. It says, last season was plagued by games where the defense showed up, but the offense didn't, and vice mm -hmm. versa. If both sides can create harmony, how dangerous is this Bucks team in the NFC? Love the content from Ohio, fellas. Thank you very much for the kind words and for your super chat. Yeah. I honestly think, you kind of saw that in the first playoff game against the yep. Eagles, where the offense and the defense matched each other. That you know, defense got to stop on the on the tush push. They were brotherly shove. They yep. didn't allow the Eagles to go down the field. And the Bucks had a lot of those splash plays that they didn't necessarily have as much during the regular season. 
I think that's a perfect example of how good this team can look really when, when everything's clicking. And I also would agree there were times like the Texans game, the defense yeah. did not show up, but then, you know, if that home loss to the saints, the bucks offense was nowhere to be found. Yeah. So it, it, it definitely comes in droves for sure, but you can see the potential with what they can look like after that, that wild card win. Yeah, and I think the other game to kind of point at is that Green Bay Packers game on yes, the road. That was a very sure. good, convincing win, thirty-four to twenty over a, a you know playoff team, and uh, and the Packers where they finish second in the, the the NFC North, right behind. Yeah, the, yeah, I uh, mean, the made Detroit the wild Lions. card and yeah. beat the Cowboys in the first right. round. Right. So uh, to me, that that game, thirty-four to twenty, right, keeping a playoff team with a hot quarterback. Jordan Love was very hot at the time to just 20 points at home and then putting 34 points on the board for a convincing road win. Baker Mayfield, perfect day. Yeah. I, I think we saw some glimpses of what it looks like when, when both sides of the ball come together. Right. And then you, yeah, this great defensive performance by the Buccaneers in the shutout against uh, Carolina uh, after the Panthers had scored 18 points in Tampa, just a few weeks earlier for the Bucks with everything on the line to get down there and shut them out on defense. That was big, but only nine points yeah. on offense. So, yeah, mm -hmm. you want to see the offense and defense put together more of those games where they both dominate in the same game, right, where you see that Packers performance and you see that Eagles performance come to fruition more often than just a couple times a year. And I think it's possible this year. I really do. Uh, yeah, for, for sure. And it it's fun when, they, uh, when everything's working and, and everything's yeah. clicking. And we said it before, but again, another season of Baker and Mike Evans and this whole offense and not losing the continuity just because Dave Canales is gone. Uh, once again, I think that'll be way more important than uh, I think other national people are, are yeah. really thinking about. I think that the next guy we need to talk about is is Trey Palmer because he got yes. a lot of playing time last year as you know as a, as a, the third wide receiver and the Buccaneers still very high on him, but. At, as we've said, Matt, I think this team's going to draft a wide receiver. That's going to put some pressure on Trey Palmer to hold on to this third wide receiver uh, spot, especially if they draft a wide receiver in the first or second round, as we expect they will. And and if that's the case, then uh, Trey's really going to be kind of fighting for for playing time. And and, um, and and you know what? With three wide receivers seeing the field more often, even though if he were to be wide receiver four, he would still get – a pretty fair amount of playing time. He just has to make those opportunities count. And we saw him in week one get his first touchdown. They scored yeah. another touchdown on a, on a great uh, kind of red zone uh, fade pass uh, in, in New Orleans to help beat the Saints. So I think Trey Palmer is a player that really needs to, to step up in year two. For this team, he's got to – be more consistent catching the ball. Ball security was an issue. Had a couple fumbles yeah. last year. And and I think that if he can become more consistent, he can be in the mix for playing time, even if this team does draft a wide receiver high. Otherwise, uh, if if he still has some of those problems with concentration and and he can't be relied upon, Baker Mayfield is going to go elsewhere with the ball, and that might be to the rookie, whoever that yeah. player is, coming in as wide receiver three. No, I, I'm in full agreement with everything you said, Scott. I think consistency is most important for Trey Palmer because, you know, he had some flashes. For example, I know it was a bad game for the Bucs as a team, but when they lost to the Saints at the end of the year, Trey Palmer had one of his best games. He had four yeah. catches for 84 yards and a touchdown. Um, the playoff game against the Eagles, he only had one catch, but it went for 56 yards and was four touchdowns. So That's right. you could see moments where he could really do – great things but then he does have some drops he had the fumble issues at the end of the year um that, that you mentioned and you know there were times where the bucks turned to david Moore more than they did with, right. with someone like trey palmer so if trey cut down on the drops a little bit maybe they don't even think about you know david Moore. and he was the one that had the big game against the packers david Moore. i'm speaking about yeah. so um I think it's good that he'll he'll be pushed a little bit this year. He's got a lot of talent. Um, he had the famous line, no face, no name, no face. He, you know, it doesn't right. matter who he's going up against. And when you have a ton of speed like he does and the crazy athleticism that he also has, um, you can't help but feel good about what potentially he could be. But we didn't necessarily see that just yet. And yeah. at least the Bucks will have their options. Yeah. Just a couple more names to, to continue talking about here. I think the next big one is Marquise Watts. This is yeah. a player that teased us all 
with a sack and uh, some timely pressures last year and very, very limited playing time. Uh, the sample size was so small, yet the 22% pass rush win rate is very, very uh, excitable. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic number. Gosh, if, you can, if, if he could maintain that with more playing time, yeah. he's a pro bowler. Like that's what, yeah. <laughs> what that number means, right? When Shaq Barrett is getting 15 and a half and this guy's at 20%, a little maddening that he didn't play more. And I think you can point the finger at George Edwards being the culprit a little bit there and Todd Bowles as well. Um, but Marquise Watts is, is a player that has gotten a lot of buzz from both Todd Bowles and Jason Light this off season. And they want to see what he can do. This is going to be a big training camp for, for him. And, and I think, too, when you look at, at Watts, the undrafted free agent, he is – both he and Jose Ramirez, this team has some high hopes for. And, and at that plus the addition of Randy Gregory is not going to mean that the Bucks aren't going to draft an outside linebacker. But what it means is they don't necessarily have to. And I know that kind of concerns some fans, but I'm telling you, this is not a great – Outside linebacker draft. Yes, if, if Layatu Latu is there at 26, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you grab him and you don't, you know, think twice about it. Uh, but you know, Jose Ramirez is another player that this team's excited about. And the problem is if you keep drafting outside linebackers without giving them the opportunity to really prove themselves, it's a little bit of a waste. Now he's a right. six round pick, and you know, we'll see how it all shakes out. He's got to make the team as opposed to the practice squad. But Right now, this team has got three second-year outside linebackers in Yaya Diaby and Marquise Watts and, and Jose Ramirez that they're excited about. I want Marquise Watts because, again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tough with you. Just signed Gregory. You, all the guys in front of him, it's, it's going to be tough for Marquise Watts to kind of carve out more playing time yeah. um, that we all kind of were banging the table for last year. I want him to have such a great preseason. And I get it. It'll be fourth string against fourth string and so on and so forth. But if he can just truly dominate in the preseason to the point where Todd Bowles goes, there's no way I can deny getting this guy some more playing time on the field. Right. That's my hope for Marquise Watts, that he just lights it up so much that Todd Bowles, his hand is forced and he has to play Marquise Watts in a couple more pivotal situations. It obviously starts in training camp, but what he brought last year, and yes, it was small glimpses and maybe the more playing time, it kind of levels out, but you don't know until you actually play That's him. Right. And yeah, my hope for him is that he dominates this training camp. Yep. A couple other guys just to hit on real quickly. Uh, second year, Servassier Dennis not being counted on to start. He'll be in the mix with KJ Britt and JJ Russell to yeah. – Replaced Evan White, Payne Durham. Um, maybe he beats out Coquif this year as tight end too. Maybe this team drafts a tight end like Kansas State's Ben Sennett, who is in for a top thirty visit, and uh, or maybe he'll be the the, the third tight end uh, again this year. And and then Josh Hayes, really one of the better gunners in the league yeah. as a rookie, a fantastic special teams player. Kind of reminds me of Ryan uh, Smith in that regards. Um, but he'll get a, an extended look at outside cornerback. He was a nickelback last year in training camp, but they like him better as an outside corner. That's where he practiced most of the time during the season. And we'll see if he can uh, maybe work his way up to cornerback, you know, four or something on the depth yeah. chart behind Jamel Dean, Zion McCollum, and Bryce Hall, the new, um, um, the new addition. Yeah, the two guys in particular that I'm very interested in, Payne Durham, you had him up on the screen, and yeah. Christian Izian as well. Let's not forget. Yeah, yeah. Izian uh, as well. He's an Agreed. undrafted free agent. Durham, I think, is in a good spot where he could compete and be tight end two behind Kate Otten. And if Koki is not providing anything <laughs> as a receiver, there's a window of opportunity for Payne Durham. If they draft yeah. a tight end, it, you know, it's a little more competition for sure. But I think Payne Durham, out of the draft class, may have the the best opportunity to be most improved just by winning his his role and and obviously having more opportunities. Christian Isian, I'm very, very intrigued to see what uh, the situation looks like for him this year because they bring in Jordan Whitehead. They're pretty set with Antoine Winfield Jr. at free safety and Whitehead at, at strong safety. They signed Thomas and Hall. So now there's a little more competition, especially with Thomas, about a nickel corner where 
Izzy was playing last year. Does he compete again for the nickel spot? Do they throw him at safety and maybe he backs up Antoine Winfield Jr.? Or they let Antoine kind of play his own position at safety and, and put Izzy in there as well. I'm very curious to see how Christian Izzyan will be deployed this year, whether it's a starter or backup or whoever Todd Bowles sees it. He's got to get back to making those interceptions, those splash plays that he made earlier in the season. He proved yeah. he can do it. I think that's going to be the key for him beating Xavier Thomas out and maybe hanging on to that particular role. I'll tell you what, folks, if you're looking for you know the ultimate starter uh, on your roster when it comes to real estate, look no further then Eric Gross and the Eric Gross Group, the official realtor of Pewter Report. Eric and Caitlin Gross do a fantastic job, when it, whether it comes to helping you find the right home, not just a house, but a home in the right neighborhood, in the right community for you, or maybe you need to sell your house. Turn to the pros, and that is the Eric Gross Group. Eric Gross Group's found, or website is housesinfla.com. Check that out, housesinfla.com. They've got uh, their their open houses. They've got their inventory listed there. It's a fantastic website. I love the layout. Or you can give Eric a call yourself, 513-907-4271. That's 513-907-4271. And as we talked about um, earlier in the show, tomorrow's show, do the Bucks still rule the NFC South? Fox Sports' Greg Allman will be the guest. And then on Wednesday's show, we're going to be talking about our new mock draft which will be coming out on PeterReport.com on Wednesday. On Thursday, Bucks first round draft strategy with PFF's Trevor Sykema. And of course, Matt, you can always find all of the latest content on PeterReport.com. That is right. So if you're not already doing so, please follow us on our social media on X, Facebook, and Instagram. We are at Peter Report. Our YouTube channel is Peter Report TV. If you like the podcast, if you like the various clips that we put up, whether at practice or at different events that uh, we got going on, please like and subscribe and um, leave a comment as well. But yeah, try to get those subscribers up. So uh, subscribe, leave a comment after, whether it's go bucks or I don't like the saints or the Falcons or whatever. Uh, but yeah, please do. So we appreciate all you guys so much. And if you could help grow our following with our YouTube channel. We would absolutely love it. So yep. that's going to do it for us on today's show. For Scott Reynolds, I'm Matt Matera saying thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you tomorrow at 4 p.m. for another edition of the Peter Report podcast. Peace out. Out. Oh.